Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, this morning's two Bowen Award lectures. Uh, the first Bowen Award lecture that is going to be by uh, Samuel Bowring, who's Professor of Geochemistry at MIT. He's receiving the Bowen Award for 2010 together with Hans Kepler, whose lecture follows later this morning. Sam has made uh, seminal contributions to geochronology and isotope geochemistry, in particular advancing understanding of Earth history, uh, including many key events such as the Cambrian explosion of life and major mass extinctions. Sam and Hans will be formally given the Bowen Award uh, this evening in Salon 9 in the Marriott Hotel at 6.30, and I invite everyone to come to that. It's not only the awards ceremony for VGP, but it's also the VGP reception. So after the awards have been given, there'll be some, some drinks. Uh, at that uh, ceremony, there'll be, a much fuller, there'll be fuller citations for Sam and Hans. Uh, the, I've certainly had the privilege as president of VGP of being party to looking at uh, the letters of support for Sam, and it's clear that his peers and colleagues hold him in incredibly high regard uh, as a truly outstanding uh, member of the science com the AGU community. So I invite everybody to come to this evening to celebrate Sam's and Hans's achievements. And I'm also delighted if I perhaps invite Sam to come, uh, Baring to come forward and present his lecture, to present him with a certificate on behalf of VGP for, his, uh, for the Bowen Award lecture. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the honor. Uh, my title of my talk is a little tongue-in-cheek, but uh, the idea... Are you going to start the timer here, Steve? Let me get... I, I could have not said anything. <laughs> right. right. Which, which, now. which one do I advance my slides with? Sorry. Which uh, keyboard do I advance my slides with? I think it's in the middle. Yeah. Wrong one. So it must be this one. This one. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, so as I said, the title is a little tongue-in-cheek, but it, it, it's a recurring theme that as we get better and better at making measurements and increasing our precision and accuracy, it often exposes just how cruel nature can be. And what we thought was a simple case becomes much more complicated. On the other hand, once we start to wallow in that complexity, we see that it opens windows to lots and lots of new questions that we didn't think attainable. So I'm going to give you sort of two examples of that today. The first will be revisiting an area that I worked in many years ago, uh, Watt May Origin in the northwest corner of the Canadian Shield, where we have revisited an origin that we thought we understood reasonably well and gain great new insights by doing so. And then the second case will be to uh, present a little bit additional new data on the Bishop Tuff and what that might mean for some of the uh, problems and complexity with that unit and regional correlations. So it's an exciting time now to be doing geochronology in that we are beginning to integrate multiple systems, argon, uranium, lead, and astrochronology. Uh, it's not without problems. Uh, certain parts of the time scale seem to work better, but there's a persistent bias between uranium lead and argon 4039 dates that we're attempting to resolve. Sometimes we're not always dating the same event. Sometimes there are uh, interlaboratory biases, and the Earth Time Initiative has been working on this. We're making great progress. And then we also have a lot of progress being made in the astronomical time scale. And uh, although it doesn't require geochronology, geochronologists and geologists always think it's a good idea to sort of test some of these assumptions with high-precision geochronology. And again, sometimes things sort of don't work perfectly. But from that, I think we have a lot to learn. So there's lots of things that we can do now with zircons that we couldn't do, say, 10 years ago. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but the idea is that we can go after very small amounts of uh, radiogenic lead and zircon crystals, dating things in the Pleistocene, 
and, as well as uh, very small fragments of much older grains. And what that means is that what we used to not pay any attention to because we had large error bars now become tractable problems and give us great insights into everything from time scales of magnetic, magmatic processes, metamorphic processes, tectonics, mountain building in the Precambrian. So there's lots of exciting things we can do. And as we move in this direction, we're having a lot better luck in being able to use data sets from multiple laboratories, largely because we are using common tracers by and large part and uh, talking to one another, which for geochronologists wasn't always popular. So this slide is not meant to rubbish laser ablation ICPMS, but it's sort of a, a metaphor for how things have evolved. So many people, measure uh, zircons for uranium lead using in situ techniques like laser ablation, ICPMS, or the uh, ion probe. And what you see is that if you have a perfectly homogeneous population, you can use the power of N to beat your uncertainties down. In this case, uh, using a uh, Tamora standard, you can get an age of 418 plus or minus 3. Done very quickly, rapidly, and an uncertainty of 3 million years, which is probably adequate for many problems. This is not much dissimilar from back in the Precambrian when I started my PhD studies. And the uh, error bars were quite larger. But now compare that to modern TIMS, you can see we can do a lot better, much smaller error bars. And again, one could be criticized by taking a weighted mean and assuming that you really have the expectation of a single population and that you can take a weighted mean of it with normally distributed errors. The same for the big error bars, the same could be said of the very small error bars. So we're moving towards an area where we're almost going to be exploring what we can do with single analyses rather than always having that expectation that there is a single population. There's lots of limitations to accuracy, especially if we're going to combine systems. And everything I'm really going to talk about today is just uranium lead and, and avoiding the problem of comparing or integrating the two systems. But we still have some uncertainties in the decay constants. Uranium uh, 238, 235 has seen a lot of uh, improvement in, in uh, understanding the uncertainties on those decay constants that were measured a long time ago. Interlaboratory bias is being minimized, although it can be more than a percent in argon and uh, a couple tenths of a percent for uh, uranium lead. And one of the issues that comes up repeatedly when comparing argon and uranium lead dates, because uranium lead dates are usually older than argon dates, is that one possible explanation is that the zircons hung around in the magma chamber for a while before they were erupted. So you're really dating zircon growth and not eruption. And it's a valid point, although I don't think it's uh, universally applicable, and I think we can actually get a handle on that, as I'll show you for the Bishop Tuff. Correction for thorium-230 disequilibrium in zircon. This can be, a, for Pleistocene zircons in particular, can be quite a large signal, almost 10 percent, but it can be done with precision. And calculating weighted dates from non-normally distributed populations. We love to do this, but in some cases I think we're probably fooling ourselves. So there's been a lot of work that I've been involved in, and many people in this room have been involved in using geochronology and the stratigraphic record, trying to date events in Earth history by using interlayered volcanic ash beds with fossil-bearing uh, rocks or uh, embedded with carbonate rocks that have a nice climate signal from chemostratigraphy. And the approach has always been to try to minimize open system behavior in zircons to eliminate lead loss in particular, and this was done for many years by air abrasion. But since Jim Mattinson uh, discovered the chemical abrasion technique, which I'll talk a little bit more about, this has really revolutionized uh, high precision geochronology and enables us to be quite confident uh, that we have all but eliminated open system behavior. And just to review that, for some of you who may not be familiar with it, the idea is that, and Jim uh, spent many years perfecting this, that if you anneal the zircons at high temperature and then do a partial dissolution, it's possible to dissolve away the high uranium or damaged parts of the grain that tend to be characterized by lead loss, leaving a lower uranium residue, which often exhibits what appears to be closed system behavior. And it really has revolutionized what we do with geochronology and the confidence that we can put in a single analysis. 
this is just a close-up of a grain, you can see that it isn't as simple as just mining out a core. Uh, it really occurs, the, the, the damage zones can occur at a very high uh, scale, or a very small scale. I just put this in because um, it is really critical now when somebody tells you the age of something that you ask for, for, for more information. So it's no longer good to say, oh, it's 66. Well, are those lead years or are they argon years? Is that a 206-238 date from MIT or is it a 206-238 date from uh, Boise State or is it a 65.4 argon date from New Mexico Tech normalized to a Fish Canyon age of 28.2? You get the idea. There's lots of numbers out there. They all uh, use different assumptions, especially the age of monitor standards like the Fish Canyon Tough, and you need to be precise. And then there's the GTS where people love to go to the internet and look up a number with an uncertainty, but the question is, what was that based on? And so we're getting much, much better at this. I'm just pointing it out. Now, uh, another issue has been the question of the so-called residence time. And, and residence time is sort of a catch-all phrase for any time you don't have a single population of zircons. And generally, it's thought if they're not much older than the eruption age or the magmatic age, that perhaps uh, the magma chamber had some duration of tens of thousands, and some people have even suggested hundreds of thousands of years. But really, in a volcanic product, it's impossible to, or nearly impossible to, de to distinguish that scenario from crystals that may be incorporated during the eruption process or even the depositional process. So I think we have to be a little bit careful. But there are lots of examples, and especially here from the Taupo, of significantly older zircons in well-known and dated eruptions. And whether we can just b apply this to every volcanic eruption we see, uh, I think, need some scrutiny. And this figure just uh, borrowed from uh, Turner and Costa and added a little bit, just looking at the sorts of processes that we worry about in the magma chamber, transport, partial melting, diffusion, uh, residence, or whatever we want to call it, differentiation, they're all fairly well established time scales. And the first example I'm going to talk about in the Paleoproterozoic, we can see two billion years ago, we can't resolve these sorts of time scales. We don't have to worry about it that much. It may be there, but we're probably never going to be able to resolve that. When we get to younger rocks, like in the Pleistocene, we are the single grain uh, uncertainties and the weighted mean uncertainties are right in the middle of this time scale for magmatic processes. So that's something we do want to worry about and hopefully learn more about. The other example, and I just like to use this, is that one great test of whether you have problems is whether you can establish a relative sequence of uh, events by dating ash beds with well-known stratigraphy. So here is a place where hundreds of thousands of people go every year in Colorado, probably many of them not believing the Earth is four and a half billion years old, to look at dinosaur footprints. And there are ash beds exposed in the outcrops there, and we have dated them as part of a partnership with the park to try to teach people a little bit about geochronology. The point here is that we have three ash beds. We know the stratigraphic order. We can measure the distances between them. And you can only see two in this picture because there's a third one on the other side of the road. But you can see that they come out in a predictable and resolvable uh, order from 104.7 to 103.9. So stratigraphic uh, sequence is always a good test. If you get age reversals, then you probably know you have some problem with inheritance or residence time or whatever you want to call it. That doesn't mean that there, each one of these couldn't have some component of that buried in those uncertainties, but it's a nice first order test. All right, so now I'd like to transport you to the northwest corner of the Canadian Shield uh, in Watmay, Oregon, made famous by Paul Hoffman many years ago, which flanks the western edge of the slave craton. And this was uh, an exciting place to work back in the 1980s because plate tectonics uh, wasn't universally accepted on the modern Earth, let alone the Precambrian. And here was an orogenic belt that had many of the tectonic elements that we see in modern origins and seemed to be uh, a great uh, opportunity to sort of evaluate whether there were secular differences in the Precambrian uh, compared to the modern. So here's Watmay origin here flanking the western edge of the slave craton. This is a simplified geologic map, and what I'm going to tell you about is sort of how we learn by our own mistakes and better precision geochronology and field mapping to test models and to be able to revise models. 
So basically, the simple architecture of the origin is we have a passive margin sequence, a metamorphic plutonic hinterland, and a younger volcanic arc that I'm not going to talk about that covers uh, much of the western part of the origin. The key part that we're going to study today will be the passive margin that developed from about 2 billion years to about 1.89 billion years, and then this big belt here of um, metasedimentary rocks saturated with plutons that is entirely alochthonous and was thrust over the edge of the slave craton during the collision. So in the very earliest iteration of the model, this looked like a normal origin, passive margin, rift sequence, suture, and that the rift sequence, if we could date it and date something in the passive margin, we'd be able to get a duration of the passive margin, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it turned out that with sort of plus or minus five or 10 million year uncertainties, we couldn't really resolve the difference in age between the plutons and what we thought was the rift sequence here. And so we even went so far as to propose a very short-lived passive margin. But continued mapping and not uh, giving up on it showed that, especially through the efforts of uh, Robert Hildebrand, that this entire uh, sequence is alochthonous and was thrust over the edge of the slave craton. So this is just sort of my world uh, 25 years ago with fairly large uncertainties. We were able to resolve the main components. This is the hotter terrain that collided with the western edge of the slave craton. These are the, the so-called rift sequence, uh, the Keicho group, Bell Island group, Grant group, and then these are those plutons that are metal luminous to pearl luminous and lousy with inheritance, which I'm sure cause a lot of this dispersion, and then the younger Great Bear Magmatic Zone deposited on top of that and burying the suture. Shortly after uh, we worked on this, we did discover Rain Tyrrell and John Grotzinger found some uh, ash beds in a correlative, uh, correlative Forland basin to the east, and through sequence stratigraphy, we were able to show that, in fact, this passive margin was not very short-lived, but it had ages that looked like they were uh, 1970, 1960, 1923 different ash beds correlated in the passive margin. So it was much more like 100 million years, and we escaped that problem. And then the question became, well, what were this sequence of bimodal rocks that we originally thought was the rift sequence? And this is the reconstruction of that. Uh, this is the rift sequence here shown to be in contact with the Archean and little uh, fault basins. And then we had the, the slope and rise facies of the Ogic formation, the rock nest carbonate platform. And then during the collision, all of this was detached, shuffled eastward onto the slave craton. Here's the big basal de Colmont, and buried in flish, or uh, molasse, the Asiac formation, and a little bit of flish at the very end. So it had all the sort of classic makings of, a, of an orogenic belt. Problem was, we have yet to find that uh, rift sequence. There's, there's the age on the object there. All right, so now what we know is that, or hypothesize, that this entire area surrounded by the white line is this alochthonous block called the turmoil clippa, which was thrust over the edge of the slave craton. But given uh, not the best exposure in the world and thick lichen cover, it was often very difficult to find this actual contact between the two. But there is one very interesting area up here uh, called the close nap. It's a big nap-like structure, and there is a granite there, the Badlands granite, and overlain by a rift sequence that was originally correlated with these rocks, which consists of uh, basal uh, pillow basalt, dolomite, and arcos, the drill arcos. And our investigation of this long after we had stopped mapping in here led to uh, new insights, which I'm going to tell you about today. So this is just a close-up geologic map. And here's the uh, Badlands granite. We originally interpreted this as being unconformably overlain by the rift sequence. This was Archean. We knew from some fairly primitive geochronology that I'll show you that it was Archean. So we just assumed in our model that this had to be the rift sequence. It had to be deposited on the Archean. I'm going to show you data today that suggests that that was completely wrong. And in fact, this is the leading edge of the turmoil clippa. So I'm going to talk to you about two samples. One is a sample of uh, a volcanic rock, a, a, a tuff bed interlayered with the basaltic rocks, and the other is the Badlands granite. And another one is the drill arcos itself. This is the Badlands granite, very deeply weathered. Another reason we thought it was uh, the unconformity between it and the rift sequence, big K feldspar megachristic Archean granite. 
And back in the day, era braided grains gave an age that was about 2.6. We were happy with it. It was Archean, didn't spend much more time worrying about it. But we've come back to look at it using chemical abrasion. And I can see our data now is clustered right up there in Concordia. And in fact, we get an age of about 2575.9 plus or minus 300,000 years. So that's just an interesting date. Just keep that in the back of your mind. But we certainly now can do it at much higher resolution. And that's part of the theme of my talk today is, so what if you can do high resolution geochronology? What are you going to do with it? And I think that's a question that needs to be asked all the time. So here is a tuff that was interlayered with the basaltic rocks. And this was collected in, in 1991 and has an age of about 2014. So we were happy because this is about what you would predict for the rift sequence. So rift sequence 2014, collision is at 1890. We have a typical duration passive margin of about 130 million years or so. And the question is then, could we say anything about that unconformity? And then what were the rocks in the turmoil clippa? And just showing you the old air abraded grains versus uh, chemical abrasion, you can see the dramatic increase in concordance. Age is about the same, 2014.3. So there's no reason to throw out old data. Uh, it gives us exactly the same age, but with much higher confidence here because they're concordant at 2014. And this is fairly high up in that sequence. And then interlayered with that is the drill arcos, and you can see the typical lichen cover here. It makes it a little tough to see what's going on. Uh, arcosic sandstones. And again, in 1985, we did, or 1983, did a few detrital grains. Uh, in fact, I think there were multi-grain fractions just to show they were very discordant, but they had lead lead ages that were from about 2.8 to greater than 3.4. So this is what we'd expect in a rift basin on the Archean, Archean zircon. So we were happy that was consistent with the model. So then just for kicks, we thought we would do chemical abrasion on these. And when we did, we didn't have any more Archean grains. They started plotting in a very tight cluster right there. And that turns out to be a little bit older than the volcanic rock, but clearly a younger component, 2016. So the question is, well, what happened to the Archean grains? We couldn't find any. Grain after grain fell in this tight cluster at 2016, which is just a little bit older than the, the, rift, the tuff in the rift sequence. So we decided to actually look a little more closely at the zircons. And in fact, many of them had core regions in them. And when we were doing the chemical abrasion, what was happening was that the cores were being preferentially dissolved away, and we were left with the rims. And the rims were 1916, the cores were Archean, and everything was a, we were, had been looking at with single grains and multigrains was a, a, a mixture. So just always doubting to test our own hypothesis, we did some new grains just mechanically abraded. And sure enough, there they are showing these some, some clearly mixtures, but pointing back towards good Archean ages. And we sort of see that as a mixture between core and rim with some lead loss superimposed on it. So that is interesting. But even uh, more importantly for the model and something we had to come to grips with is that we are on the Archean craton. We think it's a rift basin. and this ties the age of the volcanism or the volcanic, um, the magmatism to the Archean craton because we have rift age rims overgrowing Archean cores. So that means that this sequence cannot be alochthonous, can't be part of the turmoil clippa, it must really be welded to the Archean craton. And just to show you the comparison, uh, the Arcos 2016 component and the tough 2014. So we can actually resolve that difference in time, and presumably with more effort if it became a critical thing to do. I don't see any reason to do it. We might be able to get out a more complete history of the rift basin subsidence at the sort of plus or minus less than a million year level. So then the question becomes, well, what about all the arcoses in the turmoil clippa? And they look very similar. What are they? So this is a typical arcos, and it's full of tourmaline. And I should mention also that the Badlands Granite is full of tourmaline. And this is about 90 kilometers away today from the Badlands Granite. And again, in the old days, we did multi-grain and single-grain uh, mechanically abraded grains and got kind of a mess. It was clear that there was no way this could be part of the rift sequence as we originally hypothesized because we were getting dates as young as about 1900. But 
things were being pulled off, there was clearly an older component in it. So after letting the grains age for 25 years or so, we uh, took another look at them and were a little more discriminating in, in selecting populations. And in fact, there were two populations that fell out of this, this much older cluster here and a younger cluster that were related to size. And interestingly, the old cluster, 2075.87, plus or minus 0.3, is exactly the same age as the Badlands granite. Uh, and this Arcos is full of these big zircons that look like the zircons in that granite, and it's also full of tourmaline. And here is the younger component, sort of as young as 1894. So we know the collision, as I'll show you, occurred in 1882. There was no way, that, again, that this was part of that rift sequence. So now we raises the question of, okay, the Badlands granite, 2575.93 and 2575.87 for this component in the Arcos. So the question is, is this just a coincidence, or more likely, was this Arcos directly derived from this point source? And I should say, in that turmoil clippa, they're mostly uh, plutonic rocks, uh, deformed plutonic rocks, tonalitic in composition that are sort of 2.2 to 2.4 billion years old, uh, overlain by 1.9 pillow basalts. And uh, this Badlands granite is uh, definitely an anomaly in there. But that seems to be the case, that that has to be a tectonic boundary there, be and the driver for that is that the Arcos, which occurs over here, looks like it was derived directly from that point source. Now, sure, there could have been other slices of that granite that we could have distributed elsewhere in the, in the, in the orogenic belt, but it is remarkable, the coincidence. So this was something we could have never done before, and perhaps we're wrong, but it's a testable hypothesis that is, is consistent with all of the other accumulating geochronological data. So here's an example of going back and looking at a problem, seeing this big alochthonus uh, clippa here, and showing that, in fact, the leading edge of it shed detritus into this basin. This is just what the gneisses beneath it look like, these deformed tonalitic gneisses, and then uh, covered with basalt, arcos, and rhyolite, typical pillow basalts. And these are about 1.9 billion years old. And then the whole mess while it was being deformed and thrust up onto the slave craton, is intruded by a big swarm of plutons, the Hepburn intrusive suite, that range from uh, gabbro to tonalite to pearluminous garnet-bearing granites. And back in the day, we knew there was inheritance in this, and we tried to avoid it, and it looked like the ages were coming out at about 1890, 1885. We revisited this one, and we can see that we have a much, with chemical abrasion, have a much tighter a cluster here, and it's 1881.5 plus or minus about 670,000 years. So this is really important, as you'll see, because we know these plutons were emplaced into this deforming wedge of material that was thrust up over the craton. And this was the, uh, it was basically emplaced as a pluton-saturated uh, clippa. Another one, a tonalite here, 1882.4, plus or minus 0.76. So now I'm beginning to wonder whether some of those ages we got back in the old days, or 1890, 1895, are really correct, or whether that just really reflects inheritance. That's what I suspect, that we're going to be able to see a much narrower interval of time represented by these plutons. And then, as I mentioned, during the collision, the passive margin was dragged down into the subduction zone, and then hemipelagic shale deposited directly on top of the carbonate platform, the classic carbonate platform drowning event, and here are the, here are the turbidites sitting on top of the carbonate platform, and then that whole thing was thrust to the east. So the question is, could we find anything to date within the turbidites? And the late rain Tyrrell uh, found a number of ash beds in the, in the Foreland Basin to the east and in the Asiac, and those gray wax, that's just what they look like from the air, beautifully bedded. So this ash, which we published in 1991, had an age of about 1882, plus or minus 4. But plus or minus 4 was fine at the time, but now we have these Hepburn plutons that are 1882, plus or minus less than a million years, and it would be interesting to see how they compare in age to this. And in fact, we have almost identical age, 1882.4, plus or minus uh, about a million years. So now we're actually really going to be able to get at the time scales of this whole collisional event and thrusting up onto the craton. And it was very rapid. Not a surprise when we look at modern origins, but remember uh, many people 
uh, until recently, and some people even today, have a fundamentally, have a different idea about how things operated in, even in the Paleoproterozoic that perhaps orogenic events lasted a much longer time. We're showing that this whole belt would develop very, very rapidly. That just sort of summarizes the three rocks, the two plutons and the tuff are all about the same age. Remember this tuff was def deposited in these gray wackies which are burying the deformed uh, in, in the thrust and fold belt. And then here's the young component from the Zephyr Arcos. Just a simplified uh, model for this that was recently published in GSA Bulletin. Here's our subducting slave craton with the passive margin. Uh, collides with hotter terrain, which is a those 2.2 to 2.4 billion year old uh, deformed tonalites with uh, arc plutons that go down to about 1.9 that could have easily been a result of this west dipping uh, subduction zone, although we don't know about movement in and out of the plane of the of the slide. And then we got we see arc magmatism migrating across this terrain, interpreted to reflect the rolling back of the slave. Uh, lithosphere as it's being subducted and the impending collision is going to occur. And here's our passive margin being stripped off and thrust up onto the slave craton. And then what we see or what we have hypothesized that happen is that we get detachment of the slab. We get mafic magmas rising up producing that Hepburn pluton flooding the wet crust with a basaltic magma producing gabbro tonalites and pearluminous granites and finally some late gabbro sills, and that all happened, as we know now, at about 1882, coincident with deposition of the gray wackies in the trench and thrust onto the craton. So it's a very tight uh, schedule. Now if we reconstruct our passive margin again, anatomically correct now with the rift sequence here, the violent basalt, an age of 2014.3, up in the rift sequence, there's our correlated age for the Ojic of 1969, and then the Asiac, uh, the ash in the, in the uh, turbidites here at 1882. And at the same time this was being thrust, it's being intruded by the pluton. So it's a, it's a tight series of events. So now we can go back to that old diagram, even though the geochronology hasn't improved with time, except for the stuff I've just told you about, we can now see and understand what we saw back then, and that is that this was not the rift sequence, this is the clippa. It's got the older basement ages here, in, covered with uh, basalt, rhyolite, and intruded by these plutons, and that was thrust over the craton, and here's our foreland basin. So that's the story now. There's a lot more work to do. Clearly the question is what the timing of this whole a collisional belt is here. It's something that is now worthy of going back. I didn't really think that I would ever do this. Uh, um, so revisiting an old problem with new methods, I think, has given us great insight and really helped us refine what's going on in this model, and I think it will continue to go on. So it's a case of, of uh, exploring the error bars and learning a lot more. All right, now I want to shift radical gears to talk a little bit about the Bishop Tuff. Most of you have undoubtedly heard of the Bishop Tuff that was erupted from the Long Valley Caldera in California about 600 or 770,000 years ago. And there's been a lot of work done on this. Some people think that it may erupt again. There's clearly evidence of lots of earthquake swarms and, 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 mag and fairly young magmatism here. But it's an amazing eruptive sequence and the very sort of thing that people have argued for years could be a good example of protracted magmatic residence. So a few years ago, Jim Crowley and I decided to have a look at this just to test this very idea. And, and uh, this is just uh, Bachman and Bergance's uh, sort of view of what this magma chamber might look like. There's many other cartoons that one can find. I just, this was pleasing. Many of you have probably been there. This is the densely welded uh, Bishop Tuff in the gorges uh, with the spectacular columnar joints that adorn many textbooks and calendars. And the reason the Bishop Tuff is of, of particular interest, as we'll see, and there's a poster uh, later on in this meeting, I think this afternoon or tomorrow morning, by Jim Channel and others on the looking at the magnetostratigraphy and climate models. And this paper published a number of years ago on five different samples of what is thought to be the Bishop Tuff demonstrated in Argonne years and if we correct this for the latest age, of, or a latest age for Fish Canyon, it gets up to about 770. But the key thing here is that it's younger than the, um, than the magnetic uh, Adiyama-Brunus uh, transition, younger than that. 
And we'll see this is going to become a critical issue now is the timing of that tra magnetic transition and what the Bishop Tuff has to say about that. And this is taken from the Channel at All paper that just came out in G cubed and Brad Singer is a co-author on and has worked a lot on the Argon geochronology. And part of the problem here is that if you take the astronomical models derived from ice cores and from deep sea cores and, paleo and the uh, magnetic measurements, it suggests that this transition is occurring uh, somewhere in this band of purple bars, depending on which model you use, but sort of around 770 or so in argon years. And they argue in this particular paper that, in fact, uh, the only way you can get the climate models, the uh, astronomical models, I mean, so the ice volume, the astronomical models, uh, and the magnetics to work out is by using an age for Fish Canyon Tuff that's younger than what anyone else has hypothesized, sort of 27.9. And as you may know, there was a very important paper written a number of years, uh, several years ago by Claudia Kuiper and others, where they used an astronomically tuned section in the Mediterranean to calculate an age for the Fish Canyon Tuff monitor. And when they did, they proposed an age of 28.2. Well, 28.2 dials in an age for the argon data for the Bishop Tuff of about uh, point, uh, or 770,000 years. Lots of geochronology has gone on in the Bishop Tuff looking for residents, and these are ion probe dates. You can see they're fairly large uncertainties. And then here is the Crowley et al. 2007 date for the 238-206 from 17 zircons, 766.7 uh, plus or minus about 1,000 years. And here's that argon data recalculated to 28.2 at 770.3. Now, you could argue that they almost overlap at two sigma, but what's unusual here is that the argon age, even at 28.2, is older than the uranium lead age. And that doesn't happen very often. So this causes some concern, and some people have wondered whether it could be that uh, this uranium lead date hasn't been corrected enough for thorium disequilibrium. These are what the zircons look like. They're <clears throat> highly amenable to this. They're large and fairly high uranium. You can see the concentrations of uraniums from core to rim. But there are distinctly lower uranium cores mantled by higher uranium rims. But no obvious discontinuities in them except for those little sort of central domains that are lower in uranium. And when we look at the, oh yeah, I was just going to mention the, uh, the disequilibrium problem is that zircons tend to exclude thorium-230 when they form, and so there's a deficiency of lead-206 when you analyze it, and for rocks this age, the correction based on uh, assuming or measuring a thorium-uranium ratio for the melt and assuming one based on isotopic measurements of the zircon can range up to 110,000 years, so more than 10 percent of the age, so it's a non-trivial exercise. And this just shows you from the Crowley et al. paper the size of this correction. So here's the raw data at about 680,000 and here's the corrected data at 770,000. But this is one of the great examples of Bishop Tuff that so many people have worked on it. We have very good melt inclusion data and there's some confidence that the thorium uranium ratio of the melt inclusions really is uh, a good measure of what's in the melt. And uh, there's a uh, Noah McLean as part of the development of the uranium lead redux program uh, that the Earth Time Initiative has been working on uh, has a paper that's going to be submitted to G-Cubed this week uh, on all of the math behind the data reduction. But one of the interesting things is this sort of three-dimensional diagram looking at the trade-off between the thorium uranium and the zircon and thorium uranium in the magma and the size of the, of the, of the magnitude of the correction. And you can see this well-defined surface. So we're talking for the Bishop Tuff zircons, a correction of about 87,000 years. Seems like a lot. The uncertainty on that 87,000 years is on the order of two or 3,000 years. So although it's a big correction, the uncertainty in that correction is relatively low. And it's very difficult. You'd have to use extreme magmatic uh, values uh, for, for thorium uranium and also uh, extreme values for the zircon to push it up into this corner, but the maximum is always going to be 110,000 years. So 
the next experiment we thought we would do, so this is a densely welded tuff. That's the classic locality at, at the gorges of the densely welded Bishop Tuff. I thought it would be interesting to go to look at the Plinian uh, pumice deposits because there you could actually collect a piece of pumice and not think of it as some unknown volume of the magma that was erupted, uh, fine crystals elutriated from it, compacted, welded, to, to, from the densely welded sample that we looked at, but a piece of pumice would really represent a small volume of the magma, and how would that compare to the densely welded tuff? So many of you have undoubtedly been to that pumice mine. It's full of these big pumice here. There's a head of a hammer for scale. We extracted one of those pumice fragments and saved some of it, separated the zircons. They look very similar to the ones from the densely welded tuff, same kinds of uranium concentrations. And there is uh, a single pumice and uh, 19 grains, and you can see an age of, a thorium corrected age of 767.14 plus or minus 750 years. So that's pretty remarkable because with the average correction of 87,000 years because, and we didn't fudge the data, that's exactly the same age with an uncertainty as from the densely welded tuff. And when we look at it, we can see the two data sets. The uncertainties are a little larger on these pumice zircons because they're actually smaller, and uh, the, uh, so the, there's less radiogenic lead. But you can see that there, you know, we take a weighted mean, probably just be, most people would take a weighted, a weighted mean of this and assume or have the expectation of a single population. The other way to look at it is that, in fact, we should just look at the range of individual analyses. And the range of individual analyses here goes from a little younger than 760 to a little older than 780. So about 20,000 years uh, for the pumice and a little less than that, but comparable amount in the densely welded tuff. So perhaps that's what we're looking at now. Perhaps uh, we're drawing rash conclusions based on uh, 36 analyses, but it's pretty remarkable that we see the same sort of dispersion, plus or minus 20,000 years in the same weighted mean from two samples, one densely welded, one a single pumice fragment. Makes me think that we really are looking at a representative sample of the, of the eruptive magma chamber and no evidence for really protracted uh, resonance in that magma chamber, nothing that's 100,000 years or 50,000 years older. So the next step, obviously, would be to test whether that dispersion we see is an analytical artifact, uh, consists of protracted growth history so that perhaps the oldest ones are bigger grains and have uh, more of this older central lower uranium domain. That would require microsampling of these grains and examining rims and cores. We haven't done that. It will be extremely challenging just because these big fat grains here with thousands of ppm uranium typically have one picogram of radiogenic lead or less. So it will be difficult to do that, but that would be the next step and another reason for pushing blanks down, increasing measurement precision because there's a, a very valuable question here that can be addressed. So I would just like to wrap up now and say that in summary, I hope I've been able to show you that high precision geochronology is not a pursuit uh, in itself, but as we have developed better techniques to push the limits of precision and accuracy, there are many very interesting problems from tectonics to magma chamber dynamics that are now accessible, and hopefully we'll see, especially with the Bishop Tuff, a movement towards uh, integrating the argon um, astronomical and uranium-led uh, geochronology uh, uh, approaches to this sequence, and it's very key because ultimately with that kind of resolution, plus or minus a thousand years or even less, we could get at the time scales of the magnetic reversals in a way that hasn't been done before. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, uh, Sam, for that uh, wonderful lecture and uh, uh, also the, um, the insights that are gaining from this uh, remarkable increase in the precision of dating. So we can take some questions now. I don't know if it's possible to take off the lights because I, I don't know about Sam, I can't see anybody at all. So I don't, I don't know if we could just uh, ch turn the floodlights off for a second and the light main lights on. They could be remaining on. Okay. <laughs> so um, I still...
I, I, yes, I, I might have some success. I've actually I'm being attacked from both sides. Um, Okay, that's, that's better. Okay, are there any questions for Sam? Good question. I mean, I think we're pretty much there. Um, there are, you know, the question is, should you ever have the expectation of a single population, of plus or minus, with uncertainties or, or duration of crystallization that's much less than your analytical uncertainties? And as the analytical uncertainties decrease, we can address that question with more and more robust uh, approaches. So. I think we're pretty much there, and in plutonic rocks we probably should be there. The weighted mean of a hand sample of granite with a dispersion of a million years has little value, except that perhaps the youngest age may be the best estimate of the last little bit of magma that was present. And the question is when you have, you know, a piece of pumice is great because it really is a piece of the magma chamber, but in a plutonic sample you're probably looking at, you know, convective mixing of crystal mushes, so you have no idea whether the 10 zircons you date from a hand sample crystallize anywhere near one another in the magma chamber. Okay. Any other questions? Well, if my argon colleagues will forgive me, you can have almost any age you want uh, because the, there's no agreement on, the problem is in the Channel et al. paper, they chose to use the Fish Canyon knob to try and uh, bring things into agreement. But there's many more factors that go into the argon geochronology than just the age of the fish canyon monitor. So there's some disagreement out there about what age it should be. For the Pleistocene, Brad Singer has claimed that he likes 27.9, but he also will admit that for the Cretaceous he likes 28.2. So it's clear that it's not, fish canyon tough is not what we should be adjusting. There's some other more systematic problem here. And I'm not saying that the uranium lead is definitely ground truth, or, although I lean in that direction, but um, it's difficult to make it much older than that, and you'd have to call on some rather exotic mechanisms, I think, to make them too young. Okay, we'll take one more question before taking a short break. Um, could you kind of comment on the recent sort of differences between your ideas here from the data coming out of the analysis of single No. It's a good question. The problem is, of course, is that individual uncertainties are very large and you're tied to behavior of a standard during the analysis. Could be that clearly with an in situ technique you're capable of examining far greater number of grains, far greater volume of zircon, that's one possibility, or there's just some systematic bias that's never really been evaluated for rocks of this age. So I think more sort of side-by-side -side, uh, examples of that. Can you do it with an ion probe with enough precision to see gradients if they exist? And then if you were to document that, could you break the grains, do them by ID TIMS, and show the same gradients? That would be an interesting test. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I think we'll, we've got a 10-minute break before... Um